Okay, maybe a little lower, maybe not a little lower. Okay, uh, I think we're good. So good morning, everyone. My name is Joe, Joe Slowick. Uh, I currently run CTI and a few other things for a company called Huntress. Um, they might not really like some of the stuff I'm talking about today, so we'll just kind of leave it at that. Uh, I've been lots of other places too or whatever, but this is the first time I've ever spoken at main stage DEF CON, so I was really excited about this because I never thought I would. <laughs> um, because I am not the hacker type, I am more of the defender type or whatever, but I think this talk on burrowing through the network and really contextualizing something called the Vulcan leaks or Vulcan papers is something that's not just really valuable for my community, talking like blue teamers and so forth, but also provides a really good insight into how high level advanced stage um, cyber operations work for our real high end state sponsored entities or adversaries depending upon your perspective. So with that, our agenda today is we're going to talk about like what the fuck are the Vulcan files or whatever. Like I showed up here or whatever, I don't even know what these things are. So we'll level set on that and then get into how Vulcan relates to the ecosystem of Russian cyber operations and then orient what Vulcan looks like within the context of greater cyber history because I think as a relatively young discipline, we still do a real shit job in understanding what has come before and how it all links together and comes, uh, evolves over time. With that in mind, we'll then talk about what the future looks like for cyber operations, offensive espionage and other, and close out with some conclusions and hopefully I'm not over time at that point because they will throw me off the stage if I am. So, the Vulcan files. What are the Vulcan files? Uh, so the Vulcan files were a, ca are a cache of documents that were disclosed to uh, primarily two German journalists, uh, Hakan Tanrevardi and Hannes Munzinger, who um, were both former at Süddeutsche Zeitung, they're now working for the German state broadcaster and for this effort they worked with Der Spiegel. Um, hundreds and hundreds of pages of project documentation, contracting documents and similar for a bunch of cyber operation tools and uh, effects payloads sponsored by various Russian agencies. Uh, it was really cool stuff. Um, it was a pleasure to help out Hakan and Hannes or whatever on this work. But there was also coverage in English in the Washington Post. Ellen Nakashima and others published on this as well for American audiences. And you had cyber firms or whatever like Mandiant now part of Google Cloud, part of something or other, Alphabet, whatever that chain looks like, uh, who did a deep dive on this as well. Some really good contextualization from like, you know, the so what cyber defense perspective on these things. So that was all pretty cool. We'll get back to like, well, why am I not hearing about this until today or whatever for I'm guessing a non-trivial number of folks in the room. But in looking at what the Vulcan leaks are, they involve a company called NTC Vulcan, which is located in Russia. The leaks themselves, I've already said like hundreds and hundreds of pages of materials or whatever, like primary source documents that I think for historians will be quite interesting or whatever as we write the story of what cyber looked like in the 2020s and 2010s and then the significance of these things. So in looking at NTC Vulcan, this is a computer technology firm that is owned and operated by Russian military veterans with the approval or authorization to perform classified or sensitive work for Russian state organizations. Not all that different from how many veteran owned businesses you'll see scattered up and down, you know, the highway or whatever between say Northern Virginia and Southern Maryland and whatnot. Um, so, you know, other folks have contractors or whatever that are coming out of .gov space, .mil space and starting up their own .coms or whatever for twice the salaries and so forth. The leaks themselves came from an unknown entity. There is some discussion that this was an entity who was uh, upset and disgusted with his country's policies towards Ukraine and that this was an act of protest for some of the capabilities that they were responsible for or linked to in development, but obviously for their safety, they have not been revealed. Uh, Lord knows where they are right now or whatever, hopefully somewhere far away from Russia at this point in time but provided this documentation to the journalist I pr mentioned earlier who then went through a consortium of paper cut media in order to disseminate this to a variety of other news organizations, The Guardian, uh, I can't remember if it was Le Monde or Le Figaro, but anyway, French publications, Washington Post, etc., to try to get this far and wide. And then the significance of these, like we don't see this kind of shit very often. We see it a lot when it comes to, say, the U.S. space, and I'll get to that a little later on. 
uh, and some leaks that have come about from Western sources or whatever. But like other than things like if you're familiar with the Intrusion Truth Twitter account and some of the work that they've done in publicizing Chinese nexus operations, uh, seeing this sort of leak or disclosure or whatever from an insider doesn't happen terribly often and we haven't seen a whole lot of this coming from the Russian space. And so really getting this view into the nuts and bolts of cyber network or computer network operations is pretty cool and pretty interesting shit. So here's Vulcan. Um, I don't know if they're still in this building or not, but that's the Google Street View from the address that uh, was up to date as of like 2021. Uh, so hi guys. Um, I'm not going to call them assholes because we're all kind of in this together and who among us has not provided like, you know, controversial tools to government agencies or whatever as part of our employment? Uh, don't answer that question, I suppose. Um, Again, Vulcan Files covering lots of stuff, but three primary programs of interest, one of which we'll focus on uh, today. So the one that we'll focus and spend the most amount of time on is Scan or Scan V, um, which is a scanning suite, but it's a lot more than that. We'll get into the significance of that shortly. A information operations platform called Emizit, which while well, we're not going to spend too much time on that, uh, very interesting from a forward deployed information operations sort of capability space. And then there was another tool called Crystal 2V, which we're not going to talk about that much at all because I frankly don't find it all that interesting other than that it exists. That looks to be a sort of like a testing or penetration testing platform for industrial control environments and similar, but doesn't appear to be as concerning or whatever as some of the malware we've seen coming out of Russia like um, Triton, uh, Inc uh, Indestroyer and, and similar. But to get back to ScanV, uh, what we're talking about here is a really interesting program combining multiple networks to set up a scanning enumeration, exploitation, and data collection platform that goes across several different information domains. So I don't have a pointer or anything here, but if you look at this, we go from the external internet where systems that are set up with a bunch of publicly available and non-publicly available exploits and or knowledge of vulnerabilities and exploit payloads for those vulnerabilities being able to deploy those to victim nodes as well as extract information and task um, exploited nodes to then move into a processing environment that if you can make it out, it's a little small, you see on the right with that red network and the green network in the corner, CD and CD, so talking true sneaker net operations and moving data into classified processing platforms for further analysis and evaluation. So this is cool shit. Like this is like how the sausage gets made when it comes to state sponsored cyber operations. You'll notice I'm not saying nation state because if you say nation state, it hits you in the head with a sock with a bar of soap in it. But um, anyway, uh, the idea here being is that ScanV by design is a distributed multi-component system with various information boundaries, public internet, private, uh, you know, internal network that has internet connectivity and then having out of band networks, not air gaps because we are sneaker netting shit over there to classified processing mechanisms. It's designed for the automated tasking and action within pre-programmed capabilities. So we're talking about basically standing up a platform to do exploitation and subversion at scale. The purpose of this, well, we can't really, you know, there's not like an explicit purpose document that I was able to find, at least in the Vulcan documents, which by the way, you can download if you want to look at them and read Russian. It's linked at the end of this presentation. Um, but really looks to combine external scanning functionality with a catalog of vulnerable software and exploits. So like go after all of the Forta OS like everyone else in the world or here's your Citrix devices or whatever and pop those and we'll talk to how this links to other Russian operations here in a little bit. But the main idea here is automating or increasing the efficiency of cyber operations as well as infrastructure harvesting. Not just identifying endpoints that are valuable in themselves as sources of information or um, targets of disruption, but setting up the sort of network intermediaries that could be used to tunnel and launder network traffic so it doesn't look as malicious. It's coming from Susie's home router or whatever from their ISP and not directly from GRU headquarters um, located on the outskirts of Moscow. Amazit is another program that I 
we're, again, we're not going to spend too much time on that here because, again, we only have 45 minutes, and so, you know, we have many miles to go before we sleep and such. But it is interesting in that it provides a platform that by physically connecting to mobile and information networks, so installing hardware in the switching center or at the BSC or BTS, if we're talking cellular networks and so forth, that it provides the ability of not just reading traffic, and you can see the panel on the left that we have Twitter, the, uh, the contact uh, uh, live journal, I think, is up here. I guess that's still popular in Russia. Who the hell knows? Um, but various posting and social media platforms, not just for a collection perspective, but also providing the capabilities of injecting into and modifying those communication streams. That's pretty interesting because it moves beyond espionage to being able to do things like modify or send tweets impersonating individuals to influence conversations and do other sort of info ops activities. So in looking at this, we have Amazit as an information operations and collections platform. There's also some like ICS, OT shit or whatever related to that as well. Dragos did a deep dive into that. If you're curious, we're not going to get too much into that here today. Um, it's interesting because it's capable of capturing and processing communication streams, not just for collection, but for that manipulation piece as well. And that has potential applications because this is a mobile sort of system. So it's not just about deploying this in Dagestan or Chechnya or something like that for internal communication monitoring, but you could imagine, although there has not been evidence of this to date that we are aware of, of taking this into occupied areas of Ukraine or similar in order to establish some degree of population influence or control through capturing and manipulating social media streams. So scary kind of shit or whatever, people really getting their tentacles into the these sorts of uh, areas. So that's all cool and scary and cyber and whatnot, but the response to the Vulcan really leaks was kind of meh. Uh, it was really unfortunate because I thought this was some cool shit, but after like the week that all this came out, um, seemed like no one really cared. And I don't really know why that is. Um, you know, certainly there's a lot going on in the world right now. You've seen the meme or whatever of like aliens land on Earth and like dude or whatever is in the corner smoking. It's like, dude, I got a lot of going on right now. I can't do this. Um, <laughs> So, like, you know, what else has been going on? Well, we've got this asshole getting indicted or whatever, so, you know, stuff like that. We've got, you know, Taylor Swift taking over the world, you know, that, you know other things to attract our attention. And, yeah, we got UFOs out there. So maybe people were just busy. I don't know. But that's one of the reasons why I thought this would be a useful presentation to a wider audience because not just what was reported in the news, but also connecting Vulcan to the history of cyber operations, which we'll get into here momentarily. So in diving into the Vulcan leaks, they represent a significant event in the history of cyber operations. Now we just need to review what the hell is inside these things after that short overview. So in looking at the Vulcan leaks, we have NTC Vulcan as an entity, and then these programs, ScanV, Amazit, Crystal2V, also Miniduke, which Google's tag associated with Russian operations and linked it uh, based upon the Vulcan leaks to NTC Vulcan as well. So four uh, software programs, one not explicitly documented in the leaks themselves that linked to this one organization. But more importantly, these items also directly link to various elements of Russian cyber operations. ScanV is associated quite directly with the G Russian military intelligence GRU unit 74455, also known as Sandworm, uh, which is a pretty gnarly actor that does lots of asshole -ish shit or whatever all across the world and especially in Ukraine these days. Amazit, as an information operations platform, was linked to the Radio Research Institute in Russia, which is also associated with the Russian Federal Security Service, or FSB, so internal intelligence and security services, but certainly with an external mission as well. And then Miniduke uh, was linked back to SVR operations, our APT-29 and, you know, whatever mess that is these days between Nobelium and, uh, you know, throw a bunch of other stupid names or whatever at the problem or whatever, but we're seeing NTC Vulcan working with each leg of the Russian CNO tripod, which is kind of interesting. Because for various reasons, especially between the civilian intelligence agencies like SVR and FSB, and then the GRU, if you've looked at something like Mark Galliotti's Russian uh, Putin's Cyber Hydra or whatever, a lot of these organizations don't get along very well and are actually quite competitive with each other. Yet. FTC or NTC Vulcan is doing work for all three roughly simultaneously, which is kind of interesting. It's not completely unique, um, but it is sort of rare to see that sort of uh, spread across multiple facets of cyber operations instead of having just one or two dedicated customers as part of this. So with that, 
we see that Russian cyber operations has a variety of links to the private sector. So one example that I actually presented at, at Virus Bulletin last year is Schnickum, um, TSN, IAKHM, a research institute associated with Russia's Ministry of Defense, and an entity referred to as Xenotime, which we're not quite sure where it aligns with Russian cyber operations. It seems GRU-ish, but not necessarily so, and there's some nuanced reasons for that that we can't get into today for timing reasons. But we've also seen organizations like the SVA Institute, another research organization in ties to the SVR, or ODT, yet another public-private research organization tied to the FSB's Fronton botnet that was used in disruptive operations. The Kavant Institute, another public-private research organization linked to the FSB in supporting and enabling operations and sanctioned by the U.S. Department of the Treasury. And also in controller and pipe dream. Wait a minute, no one linked in controller and pipe dream to Russia, right? We talked about that here, I think in track four last year, a former colleague of mine, Jimmy Wiley, did a deep dive into pipe dream and controller, which was quite fascinating. But if you look around enough or whatever, you'll see that there are folks that have tied in controller or pipe dream, depending on which vendor you're going with a naming schema, to a organization called Advanced System Technologies, a contracting entity in Russia. So again, seeing this nexus of private sector organizations developing and deploying tooling such as Drovarub, also associated with AST, and that was the subject of a fairly lengthy malware analysis report released by the United States during COVID, which again kind of floated off the radar a little bit. Um, but the idea of this privatization of cyber warfare, oh, I said it, I'm sorry. Um, but the idea being is that we're maximizing on capabilities by extending beyond the silos of government organizations to take advantage of public-private re relationships and research institutions, as well as outright commercial entities to support state-directed efforts. So in looking at this, NTC Vulcan is both an example and a pioneer, in a way, of increasingly outsourced cyber development and engineering for state-directed operations. However, it's important to note this is not just Russia. This is not just happening there by any stretch of the imagination. And there were probably some people at that other event or whatever up the strip earlier today that had booths that are just as involved in this space as well. So let's go into ScanV and Sandworm because that's kind of the most interesting item from my perspective, especially because I'm kind of an infrastructure analyst at heart when it comes to what I do in the security space. So Sandworm historically leverages compromised legitimate infrastructure. They don't spin up their own like Hetzner or Hostsailer or AWS node. They'll go out and compromise someone else's server or whatever and tunnel traffic through there as an OPSEC mechanism and to try to uh, break the trail going back to them and their organization. And there's multiple examples of this, going all the way back to like Indestroyer from the 2016 Ukraine event, uh, where they used what appeared to be compromised Tor exit nodes as the last step command and control um, infrastructure before accessing the Ukraineuro infrastructure where Indestroyer was deployed. But also more recent items like VPN filter and Cyclops Blink. We'll get back to those in here in a minute. But the important thing is that what ScanV represents is a way of getting this sort of burnable, deniable infrastructure and doing it and tasking it at scale and in a semi-automated fashion. So being able to hack the planet in a way that allows an operator to enter in some criteria and then step off keyboard. So in looking at this, we can operationalize this sort of idea by stockpiling vulnerabilities. And as anyone here who does any sort of red teaming knows, it doesn't have to be a damn zero day. People don't patch shit for years, especially when it comes to infrastructure crap. But you know, coming up with a list of publicly known plus one day vulnerabilities and then sprinkle in a couple of zero days if you really have to, I suppose, and you have a uh, quiver of arrows to launch at a variety of targets in order to get points of presence in a variety of networks. Then I just need to identify vulnerable nodes, and what's interesting is that ScanV does have a Shodan plugin, um, so yay. <laughs> um, uh, a little unfortunate, but you know, you can't avoid these sorts of things, I imagine. But also it does its own scanning and evaluation and so forth and looking for these vulnerabilities. And then through exploitation, marshal victims into proxy chains for operations so that I can go from GRU HQ where my operators are doing operations to some Soho microtique or whatever that's out there in the wild to my ultimate victim and probably having multiple steps in the middle there so that all my NetFlow analysis or whatever that scare the shit out of Ron Wyden and other folks um, really kind of goes down the toilet because I'm doing chained um, communication or whatever across multiple items along the way. 
And so what I get is this, not like just some creepy old man staring into the Palantir or whatever the hell this orb is or whatever, but really, check out my orb, operational relay boxes. People who say command and control nodes and call them orbs, you can probably guess either they worked somewhere previously or they're LARPing as someone that worked someone somewhere previously. Uh, the idea being is that you get burnable, reusable infrastructure that's not directly linked to yourself in order to execute operations to avoid tracing back and to also allow for you to burn that infrastructure without losing something more valuable in the process. So what's the so what behind these sorts of items? Like, okay, it's cool hacking programs that got leaked or whatever, big fucking deal, dude. Like, well, there's this focus on scalability and control of widespread operations. If you want to be an intelligence agency in the 21st century at this point, there's a lot of shit out there in order to go after. And doing this on a very human scale basis just doesn't scale all that effectively unless you can throw thousands of bodies at it, uh, which is what some people assume China is doing, which seems almost borderline racist in a certain sort of way. But um, the idea being is that you either need lots and lots of operators or you need to figure out a way to do this in an automated fashion. So getting that greater efficiency and extent of cyber activity as enabled by a platform such as ScanV gets you to that point where I can do more with less. You know, this is the whole impetus behind, you know, detection as code and DevSecOps and whatnot is that just like we are in the defender space trying to do more with less because I don't know, like we do have the people, many of them have unfortunately been laid off over the last like eight months or whatever, which really fucking sucks. But even still, anyone who worth their salt within this space knows that we can't just continually throw bodies at security problems and expect good things. Well, it kind of works on the offensive side too, as you have more and more stuff floating into information space. And so we're really talking about moving beyond one operator, one op campaigns to massive distributed operations enabled by this platform of gathering information, collecting infrastructure for use, and then doing a combination of unclassified and cla classified network processing and tasking of what has been compromised. All right, that's cool, but is this unique? What's Vulcan look like in cyber history? Well, is Vulcan activity unique? I've already given you this answer, like, fuck no, it's not unique. This sort of shit's been around for a bit. So what's it looked like though previously? So have we seen similar examples? Yes, we have. We've seen similar examples in Russia. We've seen similar examples in China. Maybe we've seen similar examples in the US. I don't know, we'll, we'll get to that here in a minute. Uh, but really we can just choose our hacker. And by the way, if anyone in the audience knows or is responsible for creating this image, please let me know because I wanted to make stickers or shirts of this for years and I can't find the original source for it. Um, so yeah, hit me up or whatever because I want to make sure that you get recognition and uh, whatever else or whatever out of that because I think that that picture's freaking awesome. Anyway, so as we're choosing our hackers here uh, and figuring out like who's been doing this sort of rationalization of cyber operations, we have to look at Russia and cyber manipulation and where this aligns with Russian cyber operations history. So from a, we have two facets here, looking at Scanvi and Amazit. We have building compromised networks and monitoring and manipulating information. From those overall mission profiles, we've seen previous examples of this. So we've seen VPN filter and Cyclops Blink from a infrastructure perspective and SORM, uh, the system for domestic monitoring within uh, the Russian Federation when it comes to information collection and, and operations. So when looking at this, VPN filter and Cyclops Blink are two capabilities somewhat related that uh, were network device targeting capabilities. Like find a bunch of vulnerable microtiques, knock them over, and rope these into um, collect network collections of uh, nodes that can be tasked for various purposes. In the case of VPN filter, it looked like this was being built into a large um, distributed denial of service network likely to target Ukrainian entities, although it was disrupted by US authorities in conjunction with private sector and some others before it could be used. Um, but these could also be used to proxy traffic and that appears to be the case for Cyclops Blink when it was deployed as a similar capability of again targeting network devices in order to take advantage of unpatched or vulnerable systems to proxy traffic for follow on operations. But there's also evidence that there were further capabilities at least in review if not in outright use such as a Modbus protocol uh, capability associated with VPN filter. It was only able to collect Modbus, a OT based uh, traffic protocol for those unfamiliar. But if you're gathering that information, presumably you're doing so for a reason that could lead to follow on exploitation, manipulation, man in the middle, that stuff uh, or similar. 
So as a result, SCAD-D represents a mechanism to automate, control, and manage these sorts of capabilities that Russian organizations, principally Sandworm, have already deployed, but gaining that scalability and efficiency to make these operations more realistic and essentially more efficient and cheaper to run at scale. But from an information operations perspective, we've also seen this with respect to SORM, which is related to a Russian law that allows for, well, requires that the Russian security services bolt in some hardware into telco uh, providers and similar in order to gather up traffic and uh, perform surveillance at scale. So this has been around for over 10 years at this point. Um, and has been documented by a variety of organizations, whether we're talking about commercial press or things like the European Council of Human Rights and so forth. But the thing is, is that SORM requires putting hardware into the telco provider's network and then stepping away. Where SORM uh, gives way to something like Amazit is the ability to forward deploy that and allow for information influence operations to move beyond just the network backbone that's already under direct physical and legal control by the authorities in question, but they begin deploying that in, say, the occupied areas of Ukraine or similar uh, regions to sort of extend that sort of visibility and capability into areas where it would otherwise take significantly more effort in order to try to rebuild and re-architect the backbone behind the communication network works in such organizations. I can instead take a suitcase, plug it into the base station controller of a given area, and boom, I start collecting and man in the middling uh, information, especially across social media platforms. So okay, we've picked on Russia a lot, all right, poor Russia, right? Actually, no, fuck them. Um, but, uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, but what about China? Like, you know, what about China? China's out there too, right? You know, aren't they really, you know, active in this space? Well, they certainly are. And one of the ways I think a lot of folks are familiar with is the Great Firewall of China. One of several reasons why I will, you know, as much as I would love to go to China someday, I know it's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, but, you know, why VPN services are such a hot commodity for people in the Chinese ecosystem to try to evade Great Firewall traffic control and traffic interception. Less heralded, but honestly more interesting in my opinion, there was a capability that was disclosed by the folks at Citizen Lab at the Monk School in Toronto about China's great cannon. So this was a capability that almost took the same infrastructure behind the firewall of deep packet inspection and traffic moderation and added on the ability to inject into traffic streams to deliver exploitation payloads to targets of interest based upon the traffic recorded. Certainly things like SSL are your friend in these sorts of cases unless that is also being proxied as part of the firewall operations. But the idea here is providing an effective means to exploit individual users at scale based upon selectors identified in traffic to get endpoints on, or you know, compromised endpoints for dissidents, political opposition, commercial organizations or whatever that might be opposed to the regime or present a risk of some sort um, and there's a desired need to monitor. So in looking at this, the Great Cannon, that came out in 2015. That's almost 10 freaking years ago. Where was technology 10 years ago? This is a lot different or whatever now or whatever. If nothing else, we're on generation what for iPhones, right? But uh, you know, the idea being is that shit's change, and as a result, presumably, and we've seen this, that the PRC is continuing to invest and invest quite heavily in CNO capabilities and other cyber operations. And we've seen this reflected in widespread intrusion operations, like the proxy shell, proxy logon exploitation campaigns, going back to last year to something that Orange Sai eventually presented at Black Hat, I believe, as well as DEF CON, uh, but that was weaponized by Chinese threat actors for quite some time due to mysterious items around the disclosure of those vulnerabilities to Microsoft, but also more recent campaigns targeting Barracuda email security gateways and other infrastructure. That China's going just like wild on popping infrastructure structure right now, and we can see hints of the automation aspect when it comes to something like the Great Cannon. So looking at the combination of Great Firewall and Cannon functionality starts giving us glimpses of similar ambitions and similar programs that we see in the Russian space, with the main question being the scalability and management of these capabilities and how they would link to more widespread intrusion campaigns. Could China build their own ScanV, essentially? My answer is like, yeah, they're pretty fucking smart. Of course they could build it if they want to. And now that this information is out there, probably incentivized to do so at some point in the future. But wait, there's more. Hey, remember the Snowden leaks? Like that, that wasn't too long ago, right? That was only like what, 15 years, 10, year, 10 years ago, yeah. 
Yeah, 10 years ago, like a month ago. So note, and obligatory cover my ass or whatever statement here, that the following slides are based on public commentary and posting and neither confirm nor deny the accuracy or veracity of the items discussed. These are all theoretical things that people have posted about that have analyzed the, the Snowden files or Snowden leaks directly. Anyway, that out of the way, the leaks and their implications is that we had a popular conception that mostly revolved around the PRISM program. That was a questionable program for domestic surveillance and so forth, targeting a variety of communication platforms and social media and so forth. That was certainly important and arguably very, very bad. <laughs> But that wasn't the only thing leaked, which is why there's questions about Mr. Snowden's motivations and so forth uh, based upon the other things that were uh, cast out into the world as well. Because there were additional programs disclosed, including uh, Snowden and potentially others, because we've seen things like shadow brokers and other sorts of uh, entities come along over time. Um, disclosing significant information on computer network operation capabilities, such as widespread automated exploitation and control frameworks that were being used by NSA and Five Eye partners, according to reporting, prior to those leaks coming wild or coming into the wild. So we could talk about a quantum of exploitation. So looking at Fox IT and other organizations, uh, there was a item in the Snowden leaks concerning a program called Quantum that essentially provided a man on the side capability of monitoring traffic through various uh, observation points and then when traffic of interest is identified, injecting into that traffic stream and trying to uh, then achieve exploitation based upon selectors. Sounding a little different because there's that man in the middle portion of events, but from the automated exploitation and control perspective, like this is looking a little bit like Scandi in certain aspects. And there were fun diagrams or whatever, noting how the internet or whatever was basically targeted or whatever in such a way to allow for identification of traffic of interest that would then result in not just exploitation, but then marshalling those exploited end nodes into intelligence agency controlled apparatus. So fun stuff there. The main thing with this sort of automated exploitation at scale is that they represent automated exploit systems, similar to what we're seeing with ScanV. Disclosed publicly, and certainly you started seeing articles in Wired and uh, the Foxit article and some hacker forum posts and like how you can do this on your own, um, you know, started popping up about 2012, 2013 or whatever, uh, not that long after, or 2013, 2014, not that long after the leaks. But what's interesting is that what was Five Eye alleged state of the art almost 15 years ago at this point, um, given the likely origin of when the documents uh, actually were emerged that Mr. Snowden then decided to yeet out to the world, um, we see artifacts of this now reflected in Russian and Chinese operations. So the point is, is that if true, the Snowden leaks were arguably a disaster for the United States related to CNO and SIGINT capabilities by deploy, disclosing methodology. Like, as an intelligence agency, that's very, very fucking bad. However, it also appears that multiple other parties were paying attention and taking notes on how to build similar or potentially even more ambitious programs based on these disclosures. Disclosures, whether we're talking Snowden, Vulcan, or anything in between, like Vault 7 or Shadow Brokers, and we've seen this with Shadow Brokers eventually leading to WannaCry, this shit doesn't happen in a void. Just because some researcher or journalist or whatever pushes this out there doesn't mean like, oh, capabilities are burned, move on. Like, nope, folks are taking notes and learning from each other and making sure that they're trying to adapt to the state of the art of adversaries or even, even allies um, as they may see fit or necessary to do so. So what's the future of offensive cyber then in light of all this sort of activity? Well, well, well. There's a popular conception of cyber, of computer network operations. You got, you got one asshole on a keyboard or whatever doing bad stuff. Or like if you're a red teamer doing bad stuff for good reasons. Um, and that's cool and all and maybe it encapsulates some of what still counts for red teaming and pen testing or whatever operations. And maybe for some state sponsored programs. But a more realistic depiction of CNO these days, like you're sitting in a freaking cube farm, man. Uh, this is a discipline now that has evolved beyond like one individual executing a single operation to trying to develop frameworks to do these sorts of operations at scale. And we've seen this in multiple uh, aspects at this point. So just looking at this slide, we have ScanV, we have the Snowden leaks items, and we have the Great Canon, all representing attempts, some successful, some still maybe notional, 
It's uh, debatable if ScanV actually went live or not. Uh, I've been looking for a ScanV node. <laughs> if you find one, let me know. I'd be curious to take a look at it. But um, the idea being is that we're looking for a road to scalable cyber, and that applies across personnel, targeting, and operational security. So from a personnel standpoint, cyber talent, while it is available right now because VCs are laying people off and they suck, um, the talent is still expensive, especially if you're working in the .gov or .mil space and have to compete with private industry and so forth. So the ability to codify skills and capabilities in programs and in applications becomes quite useful in extending and expanding programs so you're not doing a, you know, arithmetic expansion like one operator, one up, but rather a geometric expansion that I get a couple of devs and I can get a, you know, exponential increase in the number of potential operations and endpoints that I can exploit. That gets us to targeting where if you are a SIGINT authority or state-sponsored intelligence agency with any sort of ambition whatsoever, global actions or global ambitions require global actions. Being able to successfully target and manipulate networks at a vast scale and just throwing thousands of, you know, a million monkeys on a million terminals or whatever can maybe exploit the internet or whatever in a million years and so forth. But uh, the, that's not realistic. So to really come up with a way to hack the planet, so to speak, we need to figure out ways of automating and making that efficient. But also, top tier threat actors know that they don't just buy AWS nodes or something like that these days. Some still do. And there are reasons to do so. But if you're really trying to do things like conduct offensive cyber operations or disruptive operations, it behooves you to start making the final hop to the victim network and where you're originally starting operations from as far apart as technically feasible, um, both to maintain your own sources, methods, and command and control frameworks, as well as to potentially muddy the waters around um, think thorny questions like attribution, but also more importantly, retaliation and response based upon that. But importantly, the Vulcan leaks are now lagging indicators. This activity has already taken place. We're looking at this now in the past tense. Thus, we need to anticipate even greater degrees of automation, queuing, and reactive targeting emerging over time. Again, Five Eyes were doing these over 10 years ago. China was doing a version of this about six or seven years ago. Russia was doing something kind of like this or whatever with VPN filter and Cyclops Blink, and then with ScanV decided to like go to 11 on the volume uh, and really make this into a much more widespread sort of capability. So this shit's going on, and it's been going on, and it's only going to get better or worse, depending on your perspective for things. So what should we expect? Well, I would argue that we should expect greater automation and improved scalability. Just, you know, accountants and so forth or whatever, they want to try to make you do more with less, and that applies in .gov, .mil space as well, so it's, it's going to happen. That's not a very sexy point. But more interesting is this marshalling of the neutral web for offensive actions, <clears throat> where your unpatched Soho router or whatever becomes a frontline article or whatever in targeting, <clears throat> excuse me, critical infrastructure in Ukraine. So how do we start defending that? And do we start doing things like automated remediation of vulnerable nodes or whatever that are in neutral space? Can we do that? Is that legal? Will that piss people off? Yes, it will piss people off. But it really becomes a thorny issue for how we start responding reacting and doing things like takedowns against these sorts of capabilities. There's also, and this is actually kind of cool, I think, uh, less reliance on rock stars and more commoditization of capabilities. So we want to talk about <clears throat> lowering the, bar uh, the barriers to entry when it comes to cyber. This is one way that I don't need to rely on like two or three top tier hacksaws or whatever in order to execute all my operations. Rather, our <clears throat> I just need to identify ways of getting that knowledge that is employed by those individuals, putting it into code, and then deploying it in some way that scales effectively. And also, you know, I'll give all the AI vendors or whatever a lot of shit because there's so much bullshit out there right now, but there are non-bullshit applications for artificial intelligence when it comes to this sort of activity. So imagine, if you will, that in addition to building, say, an automated fuzzing platform for vulnerability identification, you extend that even a little bit further to a system that can do system... <clears throat> 
scanning and classification that say could identify based upon the system type and vulnerability, what is a reasonable vulnerability that I could exploit that minimizes my risk of detection and then what follow on payload is most suitable for this device to ensure either it's a <clears throat> lasting node in my network or I can use it as an immediately burnable item for say deploying a wiper against a system of interest that I want to <clears throat> take out of the internet. I apologize, it's like day three of DEF CON, my voice is going. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, so where, where does that put us? It's like conclusions, like yeah, adversaries innovate, man. Like that's cool. But where are we now? Capability inspiration and proliferation, basically. So adversaries learn from operations and open source research. Every action comes with some sort of response or reaction uh, in some great Newtonian reflection within the cyber ecosystem. And thus today's leaker disclosure becomes the inspiration for, or the, hey, why the fuck are we doing that for um, some other party or whatever that happens to be involved in this space. With that, computer network operations is not a static field, but a constantly evolving one with multiple factors. You, know, you want to talk about three body problems? We're talking about like a five or six body problem here in terms of adversary and defender reactions and uh, relationships as well as other sort of factors that come into play. So what's our guidance for defenders and decision makers? My community. Well, adversaries are constantly evolving and learning. Like no shit Sherlock, of course they fucking are, otherwise they'll lose their jobs. Well, legacy techniques and tradecraft for defense and identification will fail. If we're relying on things like, you know, block listing or the IP addresses associated with uh, C2 frameworks or whatever, it's a losing game. Why? Because of a thing like ScanV, it's like, oh, you block this node? Well, I have 15 more or whatever over here for just this one op and I can get 100 more if I want later on. It's playing whack-a-mole and it's a game that defenders are going to lose. So instead, we need to start building an emphasis on things like behavioral analysis of traffic patterns and anomaly enrichment uh, are necessary items, which kind of gets us into that creepy AI space a little bit, but again, if done well and done accurately without the marketing bullshit around it, can actually be a viable way of trying to resolve some of these problems. Uh, so the idea here is that defenders can't rely on just sort of statically addressing individual threats, but trying to understand categories of threat action in order to then take some sort of defensive response. Okay, that's my community. What about your community? For all the red teamers and hackers and such out there, or whatever. Um, well, in addition to, thank you for letting me speak to you for a while, and I hope this was interesting. Really what we're looking for is that human-driven operations are rapidly being replaced by high-end threat actors. We're not talking about like the elite hacker or whatever in the hoodie or whatever, or Mr. Robot tap, tapping away or whatever in the dark. It's like that shit just doesn't happen anymore. We're talking about bureaucracies of dedicated developers, infrastructure teams, exploit development teams working in concert in order to develop and deploy capabilities for whatever reason. As a result, actually emulating adversaries, while it's really, you know, depending on the organization that you're working with, some of this goes out the window because it's like you have single factor auth on your VPN, like, please, you know, try harder. Um, you know, for those organizations, they're already screwed. But if we're talking about trying to emulate adversaries for more mature organizations as hackers, red teamers, pen testers, et cetera, we need to think at a higher level of like, okay, how does this sort of operation scale? How can I start mimicking this sort of activity in a meaningful way that I'm not just testing defenses, but providing opportunities for defenders to look at traffic and actions that are similar to what my adversaries are doing. Thus, testing and probing will become more challenging. It's not just about spinning up an AWS node and then brute forcing traffic on the single factor VPN anymore and then migrating to the domain controller, pulling creds and game over, but really thinking about like, okay, how do I start really emulating what we've seen over the last 10 years in terms of infrastructure deployment and then action on the part of high-end threat actors? So where do we go from here? Networks of various types will continue to be weaponized by threat actors, either as end targets, so I'm going direct to my victim, less likely for my high-end threat actors, but more likely as means to reaching them. I am going after and doing these exploit at scale campaigns, not because these targets are immediately of interest, but because they provide me with a way of tunneling my traffic to my ultimate victims, and that neutral or third party web space in between starts to become a very interesting battleground where there's not a whole lot of agreement on authorities to operate and what defenders, let alone law enforcement, can do to respond to them. Like if you hack back or whatever on the C2 server and it's a application server for a university somewhere, what have you done? Have you committed a crime? Arguably, yes. 
is that a reasonable response or whatever for that node being used to send like some LDOS based wiper or whatever on your network? Probably not, but how do we figure this out? These are questions that policy people should be addressing, but instead they're talking about commercial threat attribution and naming schemas and other bullshit like that and not really helping out. That's my world, I'm sorry. Uh, the idea though is that the increasing scale and velocity of campaigns will make defense and response challenging, but not impossible. We just need to recognize the state of where things are and begin moving and adapting defensive controls and countermeasures in tandem with that to come up with reasonable solutions. I have no freaking idea where I am on time right now. Um, I have two minutes, so that's not enough time for questions really. Uh, I'm happy to meet out in the hallway afterwards if anyone wants to discuss. I'll hang out like over there somewhere, like by the windows or something. But this is available on the media server. Bunch of references and resources related to these topics if you're interested in going deeper into these since we really just cover things at a high level. Uh, but thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. I hope this was interesting for you. <laughs>